right? So um, it's kind of optimized for that, right? So the slides are a little bit verbose. Um, so I'll be flipping through them a little bit quickly. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. So if you want to see them later, you should probably uh, make note of this information and uh, uh, find them through that. So who am I? Uh, my name is Sean, right? Uh, I work at Chef as a software engineer. Um, I work on uh, community cookbooks, these sorts of things. I've been spending the last eh, six months or so uh, kind of concentrating on like Dockerish baked Dockerish things, right? So uh, we have a Docker cookbook, we have test kitchen plugins to do various things. Spend a lot of time uh, writing tests. That's basically what I do. I write tests. Right? So I'm going to tell you about it, right? Um, so yeah. So part one, uh, two parts, here goes the first one. So uh, we're gonna start with a game, okay? It's called Remember That Time, right? Um, I'm gonna try to leave this slide up as long as I possibly can because I'm kind of in love with it, okay? Um, so uh, remember that time we didn't need configuration management because we had packaging? Yeah, yeah? you remember, does anybody else remember? Okay, Jesus, life crowd in here too. Okay, uh, remember the time uh, the cloud came out? We didn't need sysadmins anymore? Yeah, yeah. yeah? remember that? That was great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, remember that time we didn't need schemas because MongoDB came out? <laughs> what else do we remember? Do you remember anything? No? Jesus. All right, okay, so um, I'm gonna need you guys to talk, right? So you need to repeat something after me. Um, configuration management and immutable infrastructure are not mutually exclusive. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it again. Configuration management and immutable infrastructure are not mutually exclusive. Okay. Thank you. All right. You good? All right. So, um, take a look at this Docker cookbook. So, if you go on the internet, you Google Chef Docker. This is what comes up, right? Um, so, um, here's the thing. Everybody thinks configuration management is like package template service files directories and all these things um, on, all, all like the core resources in Puppet, right? The core resources in Chef, core resources in Ansible. Um, it's, it's kind of an accident of history that those are what the core resources are, right? Um, if you actually like, you know, study like the CF engine derived config management set. Um, it's really anything uh, that's a noun, right? So a config management system is, it, it, it tests and it repairs any noun, right? And then within that system, uh, the autonomous actors, as they're called, they can see each other, right? So they can notify, they can subscribe, or they can subscribe. So if you wanna know what's the same about all these config management systems, it's this, right? So um, any noun, Right, so Docker images are nouns, right? Containers are nouns, right? You can have more than one of them. Therefore, they're fair game for modeling in a config management system, right? Just like files. So, um, right, so Lionel Ricci. Um, if you wanna follow along with this in the future uh, after you leave the room, right? So just Google the talk, uh, it'll come up. Um, you need to do a couple things. Install Chef DK, that's the first thing. Clone this repo, that's the second thing. And if you want, um, well, I'm sorry, the third thing is you run uh, kitchen test, and if that works, you're set up. If it doesn't work, you have to fix it. Um, but um, this Git repo is tagged, right? So like as you go through the talk, um, the different parts of it, they'll have tags, right? So you can go and actually look at the files that I'm talking about as we do the talk, if you'd like. So, yeah. Um, I already gave the talk like three times when I was writing it. Uh, at one point it was named Feature Driven Test Development. Um, so this is kind of how it's going to go. So the first thing is we're going to uh, write our first feature, right? Um, and it's basically just a hello world like chef recipe to drive Docker, right? So the first thing you do in your cookbook is you depend on this Docker cookbook. It's basically it. So the Docker cookbook is a library cookbook. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about how to write these things. That's my next talk later in the afternoon in the chef room. Um, but you basically depend on it, and then you get access to the resources that ship in the cookbook. Right? 
Um, you can use them in your recipe. Uh, there's a thing called Test Kitchen. Who's familiar with Test Kitchen? Yeah? Cool. Um, just so you know, Test Kitchen uh, is CM agnostic. Right? You can use Test Kitchen uh, with shell scripts. You can use Test Kitchen with Puppet. You can use Test Kitchen with Ansible, CF Engine. So it's pretty cool. You should check it out if you haven't already. Um, but the first thing you need to do is like wire up uh, the cookbook that you need to test and then the recipe inside of it or the module and then whatever. Um, but yeah, this is basically what it looks like to use a Docker cookbook. Um, you need to have a Docker daemon running on your machine. Um, you can actually talk to remote Docker hosts if you want. If you have Docker hosts, you have a swarm, whatever. Uh, you can point at that instead. But um, if you need to set one up locally, you just use this uh, Docker service. Um, and then Docker image, tests and repairs, it pulls the hello world uh, container from the Docker hub. And then uh, it runs the hello world thing. And the, the equivalent Docker commands would be like Docker pull hello world, Docker run hello world, um, and then it tests and repairs every time. And that's, uh, that's a recipe right there. So the actual physical work of doing this would be test kitchen converge the name of the suite. Uh, and then the thing about configuration management is um, it doesn't, you can't really be dogmatic about like the, the test driven thing with it. Um, you'll hear, you'll often hear like test people say things like, write your unit test first. That's a dirty, dirty lie. You should never write your unit tests first. Because the thing about config management is like, there's a fair amount of reverse engineering that needs to happen before you know what to put in the test, right? So the test kitchen, it's kind of like this interactive way to like manipulate machines, run config management code on it, and you can actually like log into the thing and look around with, like with your hands. Um, so this is what you do. So you run test kitchen, you converge the machine, you log into it, and then once you're in there, you can go poking around. Right, so to see what Chef did, you would type Docker images, Docker PS, and then actually like look at the logs of this container. Um, the Hello World container on the hub is actually like super rad. It's uh, it's like, the smallest binary like you've ever seen. It's like a few K. It's like a similar. It just like prints like a message onto the screen. It's pretty cool. Um, so if you need to like, if you need like a a, a very, very small image to use in functional tests, like use Hello World. It's pretty cool. So, um, and after you've done all that, save the code, tag it, and then that's basically it. Um, there's other things that I'll get to. There's like uh, inspect, server spec, chef spec, all these things. Uh, I skipped right over them now for the sake of brevity, uh, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to those eventually. So, um, we have our piece of software. Um, the, the thing that you have to make sure that you're doing when you're writing config management code in general, not just Chef, is, is realize that you are writing pieces of software, right? Um, it's not some like amorphous blob of like config management policy, like no, it's a piece of software and you have to treat it, treat it like that. So like as you're doing the software, you'll end up having to maintain it and like, do things like patch it, right? So you get a bug report. Right, so after you've published your software, people start using it. You get a bug report that says, oh, hello is not item potent. And you scratch your head and you go, what the, or what, right? So to handle bug reports, you need to, you know, reproduce the error, uh, re like figure out what people are talking about and then go about your business of actually repairing it, right? So you do that, again, with Test Kitchen, right? So you go back to your software, you check it out, and then you use Test Kitchen, you converge your machine, and you do it twice, right? And then if you do this, sure enough, you'll realize that every time Test Kitchen runs, or every time Chef runs, it is firing this resource, right? And you expect it to do the thing the first time and do nothing subsequent times. Um, this isn't the case. So you log in, you look around, you look at the logs, and it turns out, oh yeah, Hello World exits after every run. Well, that's probably not what we actually want, right? But it is expected. So. If you're not familiar with uh, containers, I forgot to ask, who's, is anybody not like familiar with containers in here? Has anybody not played with Docker yet? Okay, so you haven't been living under rocks. That's good. So um, this is the life cycle of a uh, container, right? So um, containers are process oriented, right? So you start a container, you type Docker run, you type Docker create, um, and it goes through this life cycle, right? 
So in the case of hello world, it starts, it runs, and the process actually exits, right? And then it goes back to here. So every time you run Chef Client, it's going around this loop right here, um, and you actually do expect that, right? So uh, to deal with that, what you actually want is a different action, pull if missing, or run if missing. It's a bug in my slide. Okay, so yeah, so you make a patch to your code, um, and then you know run your final tests. Uh, Robocop is a like style checking tool. If you're not uh, familiar with it, one of the cool stuff because it is pure Ruby, which is kind of bullshit. It's not, but um, it's Ruby enough that we can actually take advantage of the the, the tooling for the the Ruby ecosystem, right? So we can actually like go through and like, do automatic like style updates and all these things. Use RSpec natively to actually um, run tests in the code. But yeah, so every before you commit, every time run these things. If it exits cleanly, you're good to go. Um, it's useful for like CD pipelines, which is a completely other topic. Right? So yeah, make your changes, incubate the metadata, make the thing, you're good. Right? So um, that was a contrived example, which is great. Those are my favorite kinds of examples. So we're going to do something slightly more complicated. Um, we're going to write an echo server. Okay. So, feature 2.0. So, uh, semantic versioning. Is anybody not familiar with semantic versioning? Yeah? Okay, so semantic versioning is kind of what it sounds like. It's, it's meaningful, uh, meaningful numbers, really, right? So, it's major version, feature version, patch version, right? So, if you're going to write a feature, you increment the middle one. If you're going to write a patch, you increment the last one. If you're going to do a major API change, you increment the, the first one. That's really all that is. So be, but because we are writing a feature, we're going to in, increment the second one. Cool. So in general, this is the, the workflow for writing you know, Docker with Chef, or really anything with Chef. Um, you do the recipe work first. Then you actually do the kitchen work, you go look around, you have the information that you need to write your behavioral tests now, right? And then finally, like after all that stuff passed, you can crystallize it into place with unit testing. It's kind of double entry bookkeeping in your code. And then finally, we book hop and everything, and then you ship it, right? So we're gonna do the same thing, go in the kitchen, wire up the suite, right? So we're gonna make another recipe called Echo. If you're following along in the, the Git repo, you check out the tag, O2O. You see that there's an echo recipe, and you write the recipe. This isn't strictly necessary. It, anyway. um, so yeah, so Docker image, Alpine, pull a specific tag, um, and then the Docker container is here. So what you're doing with, Doc, with, with Chef is, if you're using the Docker container resource, you're always making a name to container, right? So just on the command line, if you run Docker run this, Docker run that, it's gonna like, automatically like, generate like, a goofy name for you. Um, so if you're using Chef, or even the Puppet Docker module, or the Ansible Docker module, you, you basically need to have a name in the container the entire time. That way it has something to reference to look at and test and repair all the different things, right? So this is our echo server here. We're going to run Netcat, ships in Alpine, right? Uh, we're going to listen on port 7, and we've just written our recipe. Very good. Um, here's the thing. like. Containers, well, yes, like they're great and like immutable and all that happy, happy stuff. And even like you know, uh, Amazon images, right? Like if you're not uh, doing like ongoing config management and anything, let's just say you're just booting the AMI. Um, yes, fine, it's immutable, great. Like don't change it. It's about as interesting to me as a package, right? Like if you look at this, like this is a package, really. So. And this is a service, so like there's, it's really that boring, right? <laughs> um, not a lot going on, but like there's a whole lot of settings on these things, right? So if you've ever actually looked at the Docker API, there's like this is like half of it, <laughs> right? Like you can manipulate all these different settings in your like uh, in your container. You can do bind mounting. You can change like the working directory of the command you're going to run here. You know, you can listen on different ports, you can, like, depending on which mode, like, networking mode your container is running in, you can, like, manipulate your MAC address, maybe, or, like, 
change, you know, your Etsy hosts and like do all these things with your banner. So like, even though like the actual image part like isn't changing, like there's a lot of settings, and like over time you can actually uh, manipulate them, right? So we wrote this very simple recipe. So what we do is we run picture converge echo, and then we do it again because oh yeah, the last one we wrote like turns out it ran every time. So as you're developing the test kitchen. When you write a recipe for the first time, you want to run it twice to make sure that um, it's like not firing every time, right? But once you're confident that you know it's converged to the state that you want, you log in and you go looking around, right? So write your recipe, do your kitchen work, log in, look around with your fingers. So we're gonna do Docker images, Docker PS. We're gonna look at the logs. We're gonna inspect the container on the command line, and we'll see that we're, the, the whole point of this is we're looking for information to use to write the behavioral tests, right? And if you go and you look, there are no logs. You know how I know that? Because I logged into the machine and I went looking around, right? Like I actually looked logs. Um, I can inspect the container, I can see stuff, uh, but I'm really looking for something, I, I'm trying to generate evidence that this is actually working properly so that I can write my behavior tests, right? And it turns out, if I echo high and netcat it to localhost port seven, I see high back, right? So um, I can actually go to my cookbook. Um, this is pure convention, but you can make a test directory, integration, uh, the name of the test kitchen suite, inspect, which is the next talk. Um, so I'm not gonna go too in-depth about it, but this is what it looks like, right? So th this is my evidence that my recipe is working properly. Right? So write the recipe first, gather the evidence that I need that it's working properly, and then document that evidence in my integration tests. Right? So I can actually write, you know, if I run this command, echo high, pipe netcat localhost seven, it's gonna exit cleanly, and it's gonna match this regex. Right? Um, cool. And that's it. And then you, you know, run Rubicop, run RSpec, do your final tests. Uh, kitchen test, by the way, um, it also has like a, it's a state machine, right? So you can do kitchen create, kitchen converge, kitchen verify, kitchen destroy. Uh, kitchen test does all those automatically, right? So it's good for in, plugging in the CI pipelines. Cool. Um, don't forget to bump the metadata, right? Because we're going to publish this artifact on, you know, supermarket or whatever later. Uh, Pub Forge, Ansible, whatever their thing is. Um, do the thing, tag your work, push it, right? And that's basically it, right? And after this, it's just all boring repetition, right? So, uh, right. So, you get another bug report, right? Security team calls you up and says, hey, you need to talk, right? Uh, I don't like this echo server, it's not good, right? Uh, they recommend a change, right? So, what they've noticed is that this echo server is Listening on all the interfaces, and that's not good, right? So you go, what? What are you talking about? So what you do is you check out the code, and then you converge the node, you go log again, and you go looking around, look for evidence, right? So you're reproducing this problem that uh, somebody reported to you, right? So you log in, you type netstat, give it some flags, and then sure enough, you'll see that netcat is listening on, you know, Every IP address, port seven, IPv4 and IPv6, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fix this, right? So we're gonna go into our recipe, we're gonna modify it. So we're gonna go into the port. And, you know, this is a uh, chef specific, but it's basically, um, it's, it's a fact, right? It's like looking for the IP address. Um, and if you were, if this is a long running container, like in like, like production, if you ran this, it would actually redeploy the container because you're changing one of the properties on it. If any property on the resource change, it redeploys the whole thing. Um, and there's actual nuance to that that we can get into uh, later. But yeah, so you make a change, and then after you've uh, ran kitchen verify, you go log, you log in, go looking around, and then you can actually see that, yes, okay, it's no longer living on seven. So you gather your evidence that it's working properly and then you document that evidence in your, your integration tests, right? So you can actually show your security team, your compliance people, whoever, yes, here is a test 
and it is not listening on all the interfaces. And then you have it. Cool. Uh, so the last thing, again, always run RuboCup. RSpec, pitch the test, do the thing, tear it down, bump the version, ship it, and you're done. Cool. All right, so notifications and subscriptions. Um, this is kind of the cool part for me. Like, this is like why I wanted to write this book. Right? Well, this is why I wanted these resources. So, um, in like you know Docker land, right? Um, you know, it's immutable, blah 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 blah. But like when you're describing a cluster, like they don't really have good tooling around like doing surgical updates to parts of it, right? You have Docker Compose, yeah, but it's not quite what you want, right? So let's say you have like 100 containers and you need to update two of them, right? Like you don't really have a lot of options beyond like going in and like manually like deleting the two, you know, like restarting the two or whatever you need to do. Um, if you are familiar with config management tooling, you'll, you'll find this very familiar. So again, contrived example. So we are creating a Docker context, right? So a directory, Docker file, copies in file, right, and then file. So we have that. And then your Docker images, or your Docker image resource can actually subscribe to the Docker context, right? Then you can wire up your container to subscribe to the image, right? So if you go into here and like change your Docker file, change your maintainer, or like, you know, update this, what you can do is on your next chef client run, it'll go through and automatically rebuild the image and automatically redeploy any containers that are subscribed to that image surgically, right? And it doesn't have to do all 100 whatever containers that you have, it'll only do the ones that need to be updated, which is pretty cool, right? Um, so yeah, you test this, you write the recipe, you go in again, kitchen converge, kitchen converge, log in, look around, gather your evidence, document your evidence, right? Um, and you put it in your chef spec, I'm sorry, your in spec. Um, and who's familiar with server spec? Yeah? Inspect's like a way better server spec. If you haven't heard about it, you should check it out. Um, but it looks basically the same, but you document your evidence, right? Bob was here, very, very good. Rubocop, RSpec, catch a test, tag it, ship it, repeat, right? And then for the last time, okay, let's write the last patch, right? So now the marketing team calls you up and says, whoa, Bob wasn't there. To have that, right? So you go into your code, update the thing, well actually confirm what they're talking about, right? Reproduce the problem, converge your test suite, log in, look around, sure enough, Bob was there, you fix it, go back to the recipe, update the file, Bob was not there, <laughs> run chef again, automatically rebuilds the containers, redeploys everything, and you're good, but you document that in your integration tests. Bob was not there. Very, very good. Rubocop, RSpec, Test Kitchen, bump it, tag it, push it. And on and on and on. So, um, any questions so far about that part? No questions at all? Everybody's good? Sweet. So, part two. Um, <laughs> so we were just talking about uh, Building, describing clusters of actual containers. Uh, we have not talked about the other obvious thing that one might want to do with uh, config management, which is actually the building of the containers themselves, right? So uh, there, if, if you go looking around, uh, you'll see that there is a kitchen docker plugin uh, on the internet. Um, it didn't work the way I wanted it to, so I had to write a different one so that I was happy. Um, but the name Kitchen Docker was already taken, so I had to name it something. So I named it Dockin because I was feeling clever. Um, it's experimental status. Uh, I'm going to rename it something less clever soon, um, but not yet. And I do want to get it working with, uh, you know, Puppet, Ansible, CF Engine, all that stuff. Right now, it relies on Chef. But what it does is that if, if you run Test Kitchen, you notice that you, you spend a lot of time waiting. Right, because Test Kitchen has to provision machines. Right, it's, it's driving Vagrant. Right, it's driving EC2. It's driving DigitalOcean. It's manipulating machines, and once it 
instantiates the machine, it bootstraps it with your config management tool, right? It goes and downloads Chef onto the machine, it downloads Puppet onto the machine, it'll download whatever, put it on the machine. Um, and that's a lot of overhead, right? So what I wanted to do is eliminate all this overhead. You know, Docker, 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 it's fast, oh my god, it's fast, you know, like, I, I wanted that, right? So I ended up making this thing. Um, so I get like the copy on write millisecond start of the actual container, um, and then I don't want to download Chef every time. So uh, here's the code, if you want to check it out, there's this URL. Um, but basically you install it by saying Chef Jim install kitchen docking. Um, here is a git repo with a contrived example that you can uh, look at to see how it's wired up. But essentially it does this. Uh, kitchen list, you'll see that there's nothing there, nothing on my sleeve. Uh, there's no Docker containers, there's no images, there's nothing. Uh, what it does is it uses three containers, it uses a chef container. Um, so we have a system called Omnibus that we use to build our software, and what it does is it uh, kind of hermetically seals a piece of software and all its dependencies into slash opt or whatever. So if you download Chef Client, you'll see that it comes, it's a pretty big download, it's a couple hundred megs, but it's, it's basically this big hairy ball of like C software with like a really thin shell of Ruby around it, and it's like everything it's like open SSL and like lib edit and in curses and like all that stuff that Ruby needs, like all in this archive, right? Basically everything above lib C. Um, so that's what's in the chef container. Um, I used the oldest one I could find. It was actually built against uh, uh, CentOS 5 because it has the oldest lib C. Um, and then you can actually bind mount that into any of the you know, popular Linux distros, uh, Debian, Fedora, Alpine, whatever, and it'll just work, which is pretty cool. Um, and then there's a data container that we use to actually upload the cookbooks to, and then a runner container that does this. So when you go to run your uh, test suite, it basically says Docker run, volumes from chef, volumes from the data, uh, the image that you want to mutate, with uh, your <coughs> tool and then chef client. That's basically it. And this thing yields just the, the change to the container. You don't have chef baked in, you don't have your cookbooks baked in, and it's fast as hell, which is pretty cool. And then when you're done, you'll actually see that I can just show you the differences. Let me just show you. So, then we have an etcd cookbook. So we'll say right, time kitchen converge. I don't know. Uh, let's do, do this one. Sorry, it's a currently a bug in Chef Test Kitchen. This gives a warning, but. All this waiting that it's doing right now is it's uploading a cookbook to uh, New York. Because <laughs> I don't, I don't like to run like Vagrant on my laptop. I insist on using cloud images because it's 2016 and like I'm an adult, so I don't want to run Vagrant on my laptop. Because I have a really underpowered laptop. It's basically an iPad with a keyboard, um, so I have to use cloud stuff. But this is taking a lot longer than I thought it was. I like the amount. seconds, took a minute instead. Let's see if we go faster a second time. <laughs> but 
Yeah, the, the, whole, the whole idea here is like to iterate as fast as possible on the code. Uh, I spend a lot of time waiting for things, and I don't like to wait, so this helps me not wait. Um, yeah, but at the end of it, I could uh, commit this container You'll see that the contents, or the, the changes to the container is only what Chef did. This isn't a very good example. Let's see. What you will not see in the, in the, in the Docker dev is Chef. You will not see the cookbooks. You will not see. Um, if, if this was working on top of an Ansible, which it's not, you would not see, you know, like Puppet. You would see that stuff. It's only the changes to the container, which is what you want, right? You want the thin thing. But I can just tag that, push it, and then consume it in my recipe, right? So it's basically all I got. Questions, comments? Complaints? Uh, I don't understand how you were saying that uh, you wanted to switch from a virtual machine to Docker. Mm -hmm. But here you're, so the Docker is on a distant host? Yeah. I have a VM running on digital, well, EC2, uh, that is a Docker host that I'm using, right? And this is just running locally. Um, I could point it at wherever here. So if I said, yeah, my Docker host is on EC2. Right. Um, and I built the Docker host with Chef Cookbook. So if you want to see my recipe. But um, yeah, so this is how I built my Docker host, right? So I used, I gave it a group called Not Group, which I think is a pretty cool name for, for using. Um, I, I like to like log into my Docker host and like run HTOP so I can see it light up like a Christmas tree when I send it a bunch of jobs, right? Um, and then I use ZFS because I like my data, right? Um, here's the thing about Docker, like. It's fucking great, it's rad, it's cool, but it's kind of broken right now. Like, there's no good storage backend for it. Um, like, building the stuff, like, because I need to test on, like, Debian and Red Hat and this, that, and the other. Um, the AUFS storage backend, like, it, I forget exactly the circumstances, but, like, it, I can't, like, install, like, a deb on it in some, like, weird edge case. If I switch over to, like, overlay, like, I can't install RPMs. Right? So like how do I, you know, so I kind of like needed to use like something that actually worked. Device mapper worked, but it was slow. Um, ZFS actually works. Right? So I'm using, uh, I stretched together a bunch of SSDs. Um, this, is, I, this, this doesn't yet work on a cluster, the test kitchen plugin, because it uses like three containers and bind mounts and stuff. And it, like, I can't, I haven't got it working on like, you know, Kubernetes or whatever yet. Uh, that's coming in the future, so I need to like vertically scale my, my testing uh, thing. But yeah, Docker service, I just you know wire up a TLS and use the ZFS storage driver backend. And that's basically it. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I was trying to run your demo, but I don't I don't use Test Kitchen yet. I just sure. Know about it. Uh, the best way to install it is ChefDK, or it's a gem installed blah, blah, blah? Yeah, so it's, it's ChefDK, so you can install ChefDK. Um, it's the, the 100 meg thing you were talking about earlier. Yeah, ChefDK is a couple hundred megs. Um, and it, it comes with Chef. Here, let me show you. No, it's okay, it was just... Uh, 
yeah, it's we just install this and it's like you know a hermetically sealed thing, right? So you install that, put it, put it on you know your whatever machine, and then after that's installed, you type gym install chef gym install whatever, right? So chef gym install kitchen dock and chef gym install kitchen ansible like whatever you're into, like you can just install it like that. So. Okay. so I'll go back here in case you actually want to see uh, this again. So, SMR on Twitter, Sean at Chef.io on email, and uh, I'll be tweeting a link to these slides uh, later in the day after I clean them up a little bit. Um, and if, I'm just going to leave this up. <laughs> yes? Sure. Yeah. They're not mutually exclusive. Did you see the slide? No, it's not. So. Yeah. Yeah. So. We're okay. So there are actions on the resources that will run every time, right? Uh, it's, it's like an execute resource, right? Pull, specifically, um, acts like it does in Docker, right? So if you say Docker pull, uh, whatever, it'll basically check for updates, right? So that's why there's two actions. There's pull, which actually does the work of saying like, hey, is there, like if you're, if you're like, trying to pull like alpine colon latest, right? Like it'll look to see if like that's what you have. It will actually do that every time. Um, but if you try to pull a specific tag, it, it'll also still look actually. Uh, but if say pull if missing, right? Um, it'll only do that. Here, let me show you. What, the, what time is it? Am I good on time? What's going on? Quartz 12. Okay. Um, So you were asking about Docker image. So we have resource name, Docker image, right? Uh, all the different properties that you can have on an image. And I basically just went to like the remote API documentation and like went through everything and put it, a property for it, um, and then painstakingly tested every one of them, right? So uh, this is what it does. So you say uh, Docker host is not in desired state because you're, it's just like a setting, right? But um, if you if you actually look at the Docker API, it refers to image as repo, not like image, right? The Docker API is a fucking mess, by the way. I don't know if you've ever actually used it. Um, there's a lot of edge cases, and there's like I had to actually go code spelunking to get the stuff working, and like. Uh, the Docker like source to figure out like half of their like undocumented API, and it does a surprising amount of stuff like on the client side, right? So like things like mutual exclusivity checking, right? So like if you have like uh, like network mode host, right? You're not supposed to be able to to set you know like your host name on the container because you'd be setting the host name of, of the Docker host, so it doesn't let you do that. It does that checking on the client side. So you have to, I had to build all that stuff into like the, the Docker container stuff. But yeah, so build, import, pull, right? So pull image is just a, is a helper, 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 helper image. Yeah, and all it's doing is just speaking, speaking the Docker API um, using the Docker, the Ruby Docker gem. It just says, you know, test and repair. What's the thing? Um, probably the most interesting part about this quick quick is the tests, actually. So, 
is cookbooks like 95% tests by volume, <laughs> right? So if you go in here and look, it has an embedded test cookbook, called Docker Test, recipes, uh, container is probably the most interesting one. But yeah, so for every one of those 40 something, like, you know, options in the, the giant big hash of the Docker API, like there is a, a test to make sure that it works properly, right? This is like by a, a margin like the most comprehensively tested like cookbook I've ever written, right? But this test recipe goes through and says, okay, well, Docker container, right? Pulls busy box and says, here's a command, right? So this is going to be one of those non-item potent commands you're asking about, right? Like this is going to this is going to exit on every shut client run. So the container will be there. The actual container part. The settings will all be the same, so it's not going to redeploy it. But because the process exits on every chef client run, this will actually run every single time. So to keep it from doing that, um, I had to put up a not if in there to say, okay, well, if the if the containers created don't actually read them. This should be only allowed if you say something. Yeah, you can do it that, that too. Yeah. You can put an exact tag, right? That's the next test. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, and then I used uh, the netcat as the example of the the, uh, the long running process that doesn't exit, right? So between, so netcat's actually going to just like stay running, right? Because it doesn't exit, right? So that, that echo server was, was my go-to example for the long running process that does not exit, right? So, yeah, like this, this test recipe here is, is basically every single thing that Docker can do, right? You can specify ports, right? You can say, okay, I want to listen on this port, and this port range, and this specific IP address. Um, uh, you execute a container called build, and you kill it. Kill build. Uh, there's all sorts of little fun Easter eggs in the test that looks like here. Uh, um, I stop hammer time, right? Uh, oh, so I do. I, <laughs> I unpause a red light, right? So like every single action, every single possible uh, thing, it's all represented here. And that's that. You redeploy things. Oh, yeah, here's the fun part. So redeploys. Um, you got to be careful. They're not always going to work the way you would expect them to. Um, so here's the thing about the process orientation of, of Docker containers. Like, not a lot of the software that exists in the world is meant to be run as like PID one, right? Which is effectively what you're doing. Like, yes, if you have your statically compiled Go binary, it'll probably work fine. But like, if you're running like normal ass software, like. Unix software expects a, 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 an init system, basically. Like it needs to have something to like, you know, like clean up after itself and handle like the signals and like properly shut down like processes. Um, if you're, if you just like send it a sick term most of the time, it's just not gonna, it's just gonna ignore it, right? So what Docker does is it just kills it, like kill dash nine style, right? So you're going to risk data corruption or whatever if you're like redeploying containers without properly like shutting down, letting your processes clean up after themselves. So Chef doesn't do that. It's like I, 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 I'm doing the safe default here, right? So like if you have a, a container that, that, that needs to have like uh, cleanup, it's if you like tell it to subscribe to something and you have to redeploy. And it doesn't work right, it's gonna freeze and be like, hey, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shut down, right? Um, so what you have to end up doing, so what you end up doing in Dockerland a lot is like writing scripts and then calling those scripts and using those scripts as kind of like trap handlers or signal traps, right? So like what I'm doing here is I'm saying like, all right, we're gonna trap sig term, right? And then we're gonna spin around in a, in a loop and that's gonna be uh, the actual process. Um, yeah. So that's that. And uh, I think I'm done. All right. Thank you.